Welcome to the latest episode of Unfiltered Conversations. I'm your host, Ryan McNeil. I'm thrilled to be joined by Harris Faulkner to talk about her amazing book, Faith Still Moves Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> Harris, thank you for your time today. Uh, thank you for having me. You know what? When I heard that I was doing Unfiltered, first of all, I know you taught for many years and you have the patience of Job which um, talking with me, you're going to need that because this is my favorite <laughs> subject. So you're going to have to wrap me like a producer. But the unfiltered part is really what I'm attracted to as well. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I work at Fox. Um, I can do the news and I've done it for many years and I can on the Faulkner Focus break the stories and do all of that and have an unscripted talk show and do all of that, but still be able to handle unfortunate tragedies and news as they come along and breaking news. But what no one ever asks you about is foundationally, how do you get ready for those biggest moments? How do you put in a place the tragedies that you cover? And do you ever hear anything that's a great story that you might not tell on the news? And my answer back is always one word, faith. That, that's what people don't ask me about. That's where I foundationally go. That's Those are the stories. Those are the, the testimonies in that category that are coming out all the time and we don't see enough of them and i think because we don't see faith and miracles and all of that being talked about and celebrated i mean it's sometimes tolerated in certain areas of the media but very few places you go where you're unfiltered enough on that platform like with ryan right here ryan McNeil, <laughs> right here you can be unfiltered very few places where you can go and be who you are and i think that when it comes to faith and moving mountains in your life I am here to say that faith still moves mountains and the power of prayer and miracles is as real as ever. And you ought to get that news from a journalist, because if there's anything you ought to know about me, if I'm going to ask you to trust what I say is how I know important things come from people who pray. I pray over the words that I speak. I have goosebumps because I love that we're going to get this unfiltered look at your faith, how it's helped you through some tough losses in your life. Yeah. And let's dig into that. So let's dig into your okay. faith and the book. And I think the best place to start is always the beginning. So for the beginning of the book, some unfortunate stuff happened in your life yeah. that impacted you, that shook you up. And it got you to the point where, not that it made it stronger, but maybe a reconnection, maybe That's a fair. jolt yeah. back, back with God. Um, can you share where the start of this book? Because my understanding is, this is a collection of prayers that you've used and, and, and a ways that you connect with God after you've had some tough losses. So, you know, Ryan and life, we're going to have more than one or two to talk about if we're living. I guess if we just stayed locked down in our houses, nothing would ever happen. But what did the pandemic teach us? First of all, that can't last forever. And when we come out, we're different in ways that might not be good because we need each other. And we also need our places of worship to be open so that we can go there and have each other. And you talk about the beginning. I knew that I wanted to reach out with a message of faith a couple of years ago when I looked around the country and people couldn't go to church, but they could get alcohol delivered to their doorstep. And weed dispensaries were open, not just for medical use, but for recreational. And I'm like, okay, so I can go get high with somebody and make some really bad decisions and choices about spreading COVID. Because Lord knows I'm going to have my guard down if, if somebody's doing that kind of activity. Or I can go, I can go where? I can get alcohol delivered, but I can't go to church. I can't pray in a group. And you know, you can do it on Zoom and, and we were forced to do some of that. And I certainly didn't lose my faith, but right in the center of the pandemic, I had something happen that I hadn't seen coming and I needed prayer more than ever. And it was a low point that was not matched in my life. I lost my mother a few years ago at Thanksgiving time. And that was tough. 2016 was tough. I was busier than ever covering everything and an election year, so on and so forth. But Christmas morning in 2020, I did not expect to get a phone call that my father had passed away 12 hours after I'd spoken with him on, on Christmas Eve. 
And if I'm completely transparent, and I think that's the only way that we go forth in faith and, and show each other that miracles happen and have the evidence of faith, if I'm completely transparent and I will be now, I was angry with God. And I prayed, what do you want from me? What more can you take? I have young children. I were, were locked down. I couldn't see my dad. I couldn't say goodbye. He wasn't ill. He just, it was his time. It was time. And I remember he used to say to me, you know, the one thing you're going to want as you get older is time. So I don't want to waste any of it. And when I realized that I needed a time, a place, and to be alone every day for just a few minutes to pray, to put myself in the company of God, I had nothing left to say to him, Ryan. I had nothing left to say. I think about it now and I'm thinking, well, what would I have prayed? I was angry and I, was, I wasn't sure that he was even hearing my prayers anymore. And I wanted to lean out and I had started that process. But you know, when you are accountable to your family and your children, how can you tell them to go to God when you are starting to choose not to? And what does your life look like when you lean out? So I leaned all the way in and I said, Lord, I'm going to come to you each day at the same time and we're going to be alone and I might be silent. And that forced me to listen. Two words, by the way, that have the same letters in a different order. And as I listened, I suddenly realized that maybe for most of my life, I had done what my mother told me not to. Don't treat God like he's Santa Claus. Stop asking for stuff. But that's kind of what we think. You know, you, you say thank you and you praise him. And then, oh, by the way, I don't know. I was young in my faith walk at one point. I would make deals with God. Like, if you do this, I'll do that. You ever do that? <laughs> Well, you know what? He meets us at whatever season. And if you still think you're doing some of that, don't let that be a reason why you don't pray. So faith still moves mountains came to me really organically a couple of years ago when I lost my dad, but I didn't know that this journey would include writing a book. And when suddenly Fox News book said, you know, we're a brand new entity, we're, we're going to partner with, with Harper, who's been in the building, you've done a book with them before. What do you want to talk about? And I said, I want to show people that miracles still happen. And they said, okay, you might have a few in you, but you'd think you have several hundred pages of that. <laughs> and I said, well, what if I combined what I know my divine assignment is? And my divine assignment, as I've coined, is the not it's bigger than purpose. It is something that God wants you and expects you to accomplish which is different than you being purposeful in your steps, like having a calling, something that you're drawn to in his name that you that you can you know incorporate in what you do. I am a witness. That is my divine assignment. People tell me things they don't tell anybody else, and I'm of all. And when I do share stories, they have an impact. I've had that my whole life. It was very annoying to have that gift when I was six. But you know, teachers didn't appreciate that gift. I was constantly talking. <laughs> but born out of my brokenheartedness with what I used to affectionately call my dad the spare after my mom passed, I got to know him in ways I hadn't known him. When he passed, I thought, I don't know if there's enough of me left here to be useful. Miracle one was I was wrong. And I am. And I think by telling other people's stories as a witness, some of them I covered, like the Lee County, Alabama twister outbreak that I write about and Ernestine, who survived that with her prayers inside her prayer closet in her 80s. I suddenly realized that all I have to do is stay true to my divine assignment. And I'll find the way to serve. And that's what it's all about. And I feel like I'm filibustering you, but you wanted the beginning. And I really mm -hmm. wanted to tell you that it wasn't smooth and pretty and simple. It was bumpy. And the Lord had to work out those creases. And I had to be the one thing I think, Ryan, you now know is impossible about me. I had to be silent. <laughs>
I feel you have my my show notes in front of you because you led into my next question nope. perfectly. <laughs> Maybe it's a teacher in me. Maybe it's you mentioning Job earlier. I feel challenges are good things. They strengthen our faith. They strengthen our, our character. So challenges are good things. So I hope you know when I'm asking this question, it's meant as a good thing. Okay. What are some challenges you had while writing the book? Was it being open? Was it being vulnerable? You've mentioned that this is your ministry, this is your calling, and that's great. But as we all know, it's one thing to say one, say something, yes. but when you're on that ledge and you're looking over the ledge, it can be scary. So, so what were some challenges you had writing this book? I love that question. The vulnerability came from humility and listening to other people tell me things about what I had covered that I did not know. So uh, Colorado mom with her two teenage kids, the Batman movie. Shooting starts inside that theater. And we all know it by the perpetrator, James Holmes with the wild hair and, and all of that. And they found him guilty of killing a lot of people. But what I didn't know was how much faith was part of that story. And when you learn how a family, a mom and her two young girls, she never thought she'd be in that environment. She had teenagers like I do. She didn't want to be there. I mean, a midnight showing of the Batman movie. She's like, I could sleep. I mean, I think most parents think that. But the vulnerability for me came from how much greater a responsibility I had now to get the story right and only once. Because in news, you'll often hear us say, well, this story, this blah, blah, blah is fluid and the facts are coming in and they may, you know, things may change as we get along the number here of, of tragedy, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But I couldn't do any of that. It had to be right. And because it wasn't just going to be the, te the faith testimonies of the people and the stories that I wrote, the 19 of them, some of them are going to be touching other people who were going through things. Some people were going to be attracted to faith still moves mountains for reasons that I couldn't even imagine. So if the Lord was going to bring in a bounty of people doing what I did in 2020 on the day of Christmas, praying and saying, Lord, are you even hearing me anymore? If this book is going to get them to lean back in and start talking to God, I am completely exposed. And it's a frightening place to be because what if I have my own doubt in a moment when somebody is telling me their story? Like when Danny met Doug, a woman who had spent her younger years in nursing homes because doctors basically were in give up mode and she was around palliative and hospice care patients when she was young, she was in a wheelchair. And, and when you when you read that story, by the way, another contemporary story. So these miracles are within us and around us all the time. When you see that Danny meets the love of her life, who's close to her age in a nursing home environment where more people died than lived around her. And then in their life together, they start to go to church. And in that life with, with Doug, she walks one day at church. Now, the doctor said that that would never happen. But we know with faith, with prayer, anything is possible. And when we lean into God, I promise you, he leans into us. Uh, it's not a Pop-Tart. <laughs> it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And it's in his time. We all know that. But it bears saying it over and over and over because... Gallup in 1944 said that we were almost 100% faith filled in this country and that we believe that God heard our prayers. And then fast forward to the last four or five years and Gallup says, no, we're still doing the same survey and only 40% 40 40 of people who believe at all believe that God intervenes in any kind of a way. I mean, think about the things in your life that have dropped off at that percentage. They're probably not in your life anymore. 
in terms of how important they would be or whether or not they have believability, you wouldn't be doing them. So I had to be really careful as I was writing this book that I kept everybody in mind, not just the subjects that I was interviewing and the stories that I was telling, but if I was going to be moved to do something more historical and it was going to be a posthumous storytelling, the responsibility was huge with General George S. Patton saying that he carried faith with him and, and prayed with chaplains before the Battle of the Bulge. I'm going to need some sources. Well, only God could bring Benjamin Patton, his grandson, into my life. Like, let's just face it. <laughs> I'm a girl who doesn't get out much. I'm always working and raising kids and doing whatever. So it was the responsibility that brought on the vulnerability. And I think now there were times when I was scared. But it was a short process because Fox News book said, if we're doing this, we're doing it now. You've got 90 days to get it together. And I said, no one writes a book in that time. Someone does. And you and I know her. Awkward to talk about myself in the third person. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Flipping the coin now, Harris. Okay. At the opposite of challenging. I love to hear what's been rewarding. Has it been the process of writing and maybe that's maybe therapeutic is the wrong word, but maybe that's another been a way, another way to connect with God um, through writing the book. Have you started to see some of the ripple effects of the book touching people's lives? And has that been like, ah, has it been the affirmation that this is what God has called you to do? What have been, what are some rewarding aspects of having this book completed now? And then you can reflect a little bit and, and soak that all in. Being with people who believe, no matter what's going on in their lives, what season they're in, they've decided to be committed to letting faith still move mountains in their lives. And they are attracted to reading this book because they know from all the testimonials that are, people are giving all over social media. I mean, I can't generate any of that. It has a life of its own now. Um, and it should, because it's not about me. So the gratifying part is that in the center of the book, and forgive me, I'm going to put my reading glasses on. I'll be quick. I know you don't believe me, but I can be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Those are your words, not mine. I'm oh, no, 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 here. Are, she's telling today. <laughs> um, you're not there's arguing. Worship, there's Thanksgiving, lamenting. Yeah. So Peace. these are I love lamenting things. because so often we forget about Job and other people who who actually um Jesus on the cross. Yeah. The, the night before I should uh, on the night before like so often we feel guilty maybe as Christians yeah. for asking God please please no but like he just wants <laughs> to have that relationship with us. And so that the, the prayer of lamentation, well the whole, the whole book of lamentation in the Bible I should say. And then in here there's all these great prayers that you've used and that you've shared to encourage oh. and maybe kickstart some prayer, some prayer lives. So what I did was I came up with some topics that I thought people, and it's called for moments when you need a prayer. Th this is something that I want people to go back and, and read over and over and over. I think they'll reread the stories too, but this stays forever. In fact, I, I tell people, you know, these are original prayers and I put the scriptural inspiration for them so they can go deeper in the Bible. So from my words, I prove that you don't have to be perfect to pray. And so the lamenting, when you read it, I'm not an expert at this. This is not my calling. But from the people that I've talked with for the book, and the faith and miracles and struggles, I mean, drug addiction, depression, when you look at the topics in this book and where people have been, and, and some of them had prayed their whole lives, as I like to say, some prayed before the storms in their lives, some prayed during and some prayed after. Ernestine in the prayer closet played, prayed the whole time She for those 80 some years of her life. Um, but not everybody's like that. The book starts out with teenagers. And so I, I'm excited about the fact that you've noticed these original prayers because this is how I know people can get started. When I talk about healing, the words are so simplistic, but they're based on Isaiah 38, 1 through 6 and Mark 10, 46, 52. They're based on those things. So 
when you dig deeper, you have like a, a roadmap for how to read that section about healing in the Bible. I, I wanted to make it accessible and easy for people. And, and the greatest blessing has been at the book signings and I, I'm doing more of them. It's been kind of hard to travel after uh, after the book came out on the 15th because it was right after the election and the runoff just finished yesterday. But I've gotten a couple of big ones in and uh, I'm going to Dallas on December 18th. So when you go to a Barnes and Noble or wherever you end up going, those are fairly secular environments. So it's interesting to see like the people who work at the different stores come out <laughs> because I'll stop the, the book signing for a minute and I'll say, you know what? I want to just take a, a survey of everybody in line. Is there anybody who wants us to pray for someone? And we'll do a giant prayer circle. And I've seen people come from other parts of the store who weren't intending to buy the book. They didn't even know, like, what's Fox? I don't watch Fox. I'm, I'm like, I'm over here with my kid. I'm not paying any attention <laughs> to that. I work like a triple shift. And they'll say, can you pray for Steve? And we do. And we'll take a few minutes and we'll do a prayer circle. And I'll tell people, you know, I'm not a pastor. And I don't think any of us ever feels like we have to be perfect. But can we support each other and remind each other how important it is that we stop trying to be and that we just pray? And I think that's been the greatest gift because I don't think I've really said that out loud. But I say it all the time now. And we do these prayer circles. And when we're finished, not a dry eye in the house, out of joy. It's like, oh, I needed that. That was like oxygen. And I'm like, I needed it too. Harris, we have to wrap. Our time is up. But one final quick question. Okay. I want to end on this note. Is there a website for the book? Is there a place where they can learn about the book tours? And where can they buy a copy of your book? All right. Three things. Uh, the best place to go is the Fox, Fox Nation app. There is a special that I did, a one-hour special on the book to learn more about it. Perfect. Um, and you can just go down to, well, you it's got a search. So just put in Faith Still Moves Mountains. It's pretty easy. And we got a lot of great feedback from that because I, you see Ernestine. You, you see something. You see General George S. Patton's grandson that I interviewed. And so it's it's great. Um, where can you buy it? Amazon. Uh, it's a bestseller on Amazon. It's a New York Times number one bestseller its first week. So I've been very blessed to have it everywhere now. You can go to Target. My kids saw it in Target the other day and they had a sign that said only one left. <laughs> it's a bestseller at Walmart. Perfect. Uh, any place online. You know, um, okay. I like to buy stuff in person. A lot of people are buying this book right now for Christmas for gifts. And I think faith is the greatest gift we give. And um, what was your third question? I think I got them all. I think you got them all. I think I did. So I know I, you're pressed for time. So I, I, I don't want you to get in trouble no, <laughs> or me to get in trouble. With someone in your life, get it for Christmas for them this year. And then read together those passages, those original prayers. Pray together. Thank you. Harris, Ryan. thank you for your time. I hope you have a great Christmas you with, too. Your, with your kiddos and your, and your husband. Thank and you. it's a blessed time. You have a blessed one too. Bye. Thank you.